Okay, I think we're good. Right. Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, next edition of the InfoSec Research Seminar. Uh, thanks for coming early. Sorry for the time mix up. Uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce Isabel Straw. Who has a very interesting CV? She's actually an emergency doctor, but she's also working on cybersecurity, machine learning, and so on. And today she will present uh, some of her research on when plane implants go wrong. As far as I know, that was a DEF CON presentation, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, take it away. So, thank you for having me. Um, and yes, this is a fancy dress. A bit of a timing mix up, so I am going to a AD shift after this, which is fine. I'll get the full fancy dress. Um, this, as I mentioned, I'm talking about cybersecurity, but in relation to medicine. So I work in a &E in North London. Um, I do a PhD at UCL on artificial intelligence, and that's mostly been looking at sort of discriminatory biases and algorithms to kind of prevent uh, sexism or racism in medical AI. But this um, came up in my clinical work. So this relates to a patient that I had in the emergency department. And then uh, from there, developed this sort of cybersecurity research interest, um, which helped having obviously the AI background as well. So firstly, just to say all of this is kind of thanks to the patient who was willing to share this research with us. And um, it's now coming out in the British Medical Journal. And if it wasn't for them being willing to engage in the process, and share their story, none of this would be possible. So, just yeah, can you like maybe stand a little bit closer to the left? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, the microphone. Yeah, we have some background noise. Like it? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, yeah. no, it's it's true. Like, the online audience says it's better now. Oh, is it okay? That's good. <laughs> Hello, oh, mine's just popping up. Okay, um. So yes, thank you to the patient who's brought us here. I'm going to use the pseudonym Isaac, uh, which is obviously not his real name. Um, and we'll be talking about what happens when medical technologies go wrong. So firstly, just to kind of scope out what we mean by medical technologies and how many different things this can relate to, I like to think of it as internal or external to the body. So we can think about the medical technologies that exist in our everyday environment. It's referred to as the Internet of Medical Things, a take on the IoT, but within the healthcare setting. And so this might be your consumer technologies, your Fitbit that streams to your devices or those glucose sensors you might have seen on people that can stream to your device or to the cloud, to your clinician. And then that clinician being based in a hospital system, their own IT infrastructure, drug delivery systems in the hospital that can be connected to the mainframe, imaging, telemedicine, all of these things that we now rely on in healthcare as part of the IT infrastructure. And then on a more individual level, we can think about ingested or implanted medical devices. So the oldest uh, examples of this are kind of pacemakers traditionally. So that top chest x-ray there shows a pacemaker sat uh, in the left of the chest. If you don't know about those technologies, they're small pieces of hardware which have a battery and an electrical circuit and it delivers an electrical current into the heart tissue to try and improve things like the rhythm and the heartbeat for people with long-term heart conditions. But that same hardware has now been extended to other areas. So the other X-ray you can see is for a spinal stimulator, which are used for uh, things like back pain um, or after spinal injuries. And these are used in brain stimulators as well. The hand X-ray is showing some consumer technology. So this is an RFID, RFID chip. Some of you might've seen these done in the hobbyist space for, um, for kind of biohacking and, and implantables. But there's a company in the South of England who I work with who um, do implant these each week. And it's mainly adolescents who see it as kind of the new tattoo. And you can, uh, yeah, I don't know what their parents say, but uh, that's how they see it. And they can have kind of NFC connectivity um, or obviously radio frequency connectivity, and you can use it to open doors, unlock your phone, that kind of thing. Um, at the moment, interestingly, they're not classed under medical device legislation. They're considered body modification, but obviously they are under the skin, so it can have medical complications. And then those pills at the top, the white and blue pills, are 
digital pills, which is a new area of research where they contain um, sensors that can stream outside the body. So they get activated in the stomach by the stomach acid and they can stream physiological data as they pass through your GI tract. Obviously, all of these things can go wrong. So we're going to talk about one case when things go wrong. And this is relating to the patient eyes that I mentioned earlier. So I want you to all imagine you're in an A&E department at 2 a.m. on a night shift. And if you've been fortunate enough to never be in an A&E department, I can tell you it's busy, it's noisy, quite a lot of stressed people. And we hear that we've got this patient coming in in an ambulance and he's out of area, which means we're not his local team and we don't know any of his past medical history and we don't have any medical records. Which is particularly relevant in uh, this case when past medical history can help inform so much of the care. So Isaac comes in, he's a 50-ish year old male and he's extremely unwell. He's struggling to speak to us. He's got this sort of slurred, interrupted speech. All of his limbs are shaking really violently, which makes it very difficult to do things like take blood tests or assess him. He's got this uncontrolled movement. He's got very rigid limbs and they're tremoring at the same time as this movement. He's very emotionally distressed and sad. And from what he is able to communicate, he's telling us he has this severe headache at the back of his head, severe septal headache. He's also able to tell us that he's got a background in Parkinson's disease. And normally he manages this with this deep brain stimulator that's in place that we'll come on to, and also L-dopa medications. He says today, all of those medications have stopped working. The symptoms have got worse for than anything he's experienced before. And so when we see an acute case like this in neurology, we think about causes specific to the condition. So why does Parkinson's suddenly get worse? And it can be if you've had a medication change that's not been right for you, or if you've got some sort of underlying infection like COVID. Alternatively, it could be nothing to do with Parkinson's disease. It could be a stroke, some kind of intracranial bleed, infection of the central nervous system. And so this is where we're doing our differential diagnosis, trying to figure out what type of pathology is going on. And so we start investigating, we do blood tests, ECGs, urine tests, and unfortunately everything is coming back normal, which is really unusual for such a sick patient in a hospital setting. And the only thing we see that is changing is his creatinine kinase, which is a chemical marker for when your muscles are breaking down. And so we know that symptoms he's having are causing this disturbing changes in his blood, but we've got no indication of what's actually causing it, no signs of infection or inflammation, etc. We also do a CT scan to have a look for a bleed in his brain, and the brain tissue itself looks normal, uh, but we do get a pretty picture of the deep brain stimulator, which looks like this. So pausing for a moment just to go over what a deep brain stimulator is. Yeah. Is there a way that you could uh, lower that image that was used by this? Is it yeah. going on your slide? Okay. Uh, just this bit, yeah? Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh. Just, yeah. There we go. Better? Uh, yeah. Um, so deep brain stimulators came in in the 1980s and originally for Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is a chronic neurological degenerative disease in which parts of the brain tissue die. And so specifically in this anatomical area called the basal ganglia, those nerve cells die. And as that happens, you get these deteriorating symptoms of rigidity, difficult to walk, extensive difficulties with speech. And so this was uh, in the past managed with medications, but the brain obviously relies on chemical signaling, but also electrical signaling your nerves transmit electrical signals. And so the researchers idea was if we can bring in electrical signals in a different way, maybe we can reduce the symptoms. And that's what the deep brain stimulator does. And it does it really effectively for Parkinson's patients. And it delivers electrical stimulation to particular anatomical areas. Since sort of 2013, the last decade, we have seen this emerging for new indications. So it's now used in mental health for OCD, bipolar, depression, and there's evolving research in this area as to whether it's effective or not for these patients. No, it doesn't like me anymore. Let's see how that goes. So the basic uh, components of this technology are three things. You have this neurostimulator in the chest, which looks a little bit like a pacemaker, and it's a solid piece of hardware with the battery and electrical circuit. From there, you have wires that run up to the scalp underneath the skin, and then the electrodes penetrate into the brain tissue. So these are your three main components. At the neurostimulator point, you can then set the parameters for what sort of electrical stimulation you want. So you can check the pulse width, the voltage, and you can set these things within specific ranges for each patient. 
Now, since 2013, and since we've had these emerging indications of where the innovative changes in these technologies is that they're now bi-directional and there's increased connectivity. So the new DBS technologies, as well as delivering voltage into parts of the brain, can read brain activity. And so what this means is they can stream brain activity directly and you can uh, interpret that externally with say a tablet and using that you can set specific parameters for a patient. So the idea of it is that you can personalize care, make sure your settings are specific to that individual disease. What it also means is now that we're extracting brain data, we have to think about the security of that. What does that mean for neurosecurity? Um, and the United Nations have done a really interesting piece on the ethics of neurotechnology. And what does it mean that we can now extract brain data? What does that mean for confidentiality? And then also the connectivity of the device, the fact that you can externally uh, examine it now, means it opens up new vulnerabilities in terms of cybersecurity. So in terms of the connectivity and element of it, in this image here, you can see one of the most uh, recent developments in this technology from 2021. And this was developed so that patients could stream their data while they were in their home. And then the idea is in the future, you can develop closed loop systems where the parameters of the brain stimulator adjusts automatically according to the brain data that's being streamed to the device. And you've got an RF telemetry connectivity to a small device external to the body. And then this goes to a tablet, which is uploaded to the cloud. So coming back to Isaac, he's still in our emergency department. He's still unwell, and we've still not been able to make him any better. Got these symptoms of rapid movement, struggling to speak, very, very upset. And so in these cases, we would normally give a number of different treatments, but most of our treatments weren't really working. So we're giving things like benzodiazepines, which are having a very limited effect. Which makes sense when you think about it because these medicines are tailored to human tissue not to hardware faults and so we have this concern of what do we do if this person gets worse when our medicine is in specific to this disease so at this point we're trying to work out what's going wrong and is it the device and so we go through his bag find the remote control for this device which can tell you the settings externally and as emergency doctors we've never seen this before we've no idea what it is it's 2 a.m. We have no one on site who has any expertise. So we take a photo of it and we do a reverse Google image search. <laughs> and we find the user manual and we're printing off a hundred page user manual in the middle of the night in AME. And uh, we find the error page and we look at the picture and the error just said it's all desynchronized. Great. So we, we don't know really what to do with this information. <laughs> and so we're on the phone to the specialist hospital who implant these things and other stuff. But unfortunately, they tell us that um, they don't have any beds available due to COVID-19, so we can't transfer the patient there. And we don't have an on-call clinical programmer who can come in and reset the device settings. And so what we're now faced with is an acutely unwell patient who's getting worse and worse. We're seeing kidney injury potentially because of the uh, muscle breakdown. They've got uncontrolled pain. We're not getting top of their symptoms. And one thing we think about in a &E is what's the escalation plan? So in any patient who's sick, are they going to get worse? Do they need to go to intensive care? Are they going to need anaesthetic? Are they going to need to be ventilated? We have no idea with this patient what its force is going to be. And we also don't know whether our treatments could work. We don't even know if we can anaesthetize someone who has a hardware fault. And so what ends up happening is for the next kind of 12 to 24 hours, we do um, a fine time, really. Uh, just trying to manage the symptoms that he has. We're giving him IV fluids, we're giving him benzos for some of his symptoms, but we're not really able to resolve a lot of it. And so eventually we transfer him to the specialist unit. And when he does get there, he's attended to by the clinical programmer during normal daytime hours. Uh, and from the tablet, they're able to check the device settings and they find that the voltage was way out of its prescribed range. And so they reset the voltage settings and everything stops. Movement stops, headache stops, symptoms go away. And so we follow up on this case and we talk to the specialist team about what's caused this DBS to fail. And um, because for the patient, especially, he wants to know how do we stop this happening again? And unfortunately, what we find with devices, often medical devices, is they don't have the capacity to log errors, to log software errors. There's not necessarily the memory allocated to that. And so we don't actually know what's gone wrong with this man's device. We do know that it's now back working again and then he's going on with his life and um, it obviously raises this question about what can go wrong with them and also what should clinicians do in the emergency setting and should we have on-call clinical programmers on night shift so lots of learning points from this i think both for the medics but also for people working in device development or cyber security 
And one of the first uh, points I wanted to raise was how varied these syndromes can be, and also the degree of clinical harm that can potentially occur. So since this case, I've been for the past year working in these digital syndromes and what happens when pathology occurs at the intersection of human health and the digital device. And with DVS specifically, uh, when we're looking at the brain implants, because your electrical current is sighted within the brain, it can manifest in any of your physiological systems, really. So it can manifest as movement disorders, mental health. This first case here where there was a battery depletion, a woman came in with a fever and a tachycardia, which we assumed was an infection, like a sepsis. And in this case, the authors report that she got treated for nine days with aggressive antibiotics until on day nine, someone noted the battery had depleted in DVS, corrected it, and then all the symptoms resolved. But again, it raises this issue of managing to identify device errors. The second case um, is quite remarkable. So this was a patient with Parkinson's disease with a, a deep brain stimulator in place. And they, over time, had been deteriorating with their Parkinson's disease, struggling to walk, struggling to speak. And then one day the carer came in to see them. This patient's normally wheel bound at this point, and he's up talking fluently and walking around. And she at the same time notices that the DBS batteries died and realizes that the DBS was causing the symptoms and it was just within the wrong settings. And so it raises this question of how do we distinguish symptoms from a device failure from symptoms from disease progression? Because often the device is sighted in the anatomical location of the pathology. And so it's very difficult for it to be distinguished from the actual disease process itself. And then this last one here was quite an interesting um, case where they looked at what happened when one electrode broke and the other was still working and it shifted mood quite significantly from depression to mania and say so the kind of mental health sequelae that can also occur. For the clinicians and for anyone who's trying to investigate when these things go wrong, what we learned was that most hospital investigations aren't really appropriate. So our standard blood panels, urine tests, these things aren't tailored for picking up errors in technology or hardware. And so it's difficult to identify these things when they do occur. Again, with the device failure, mimicking the disease process and how we distinguish that. And then another third point, the place where the patient presents might not be the speciality you know about the device. So if you have pacemakers being developed in cardiology, your cardiologist might have quite a good knowledge of that technology. But if the error that occurs causes a completely different symptom coming to a different specialty, then you're facing a different, difficult challenge. So the first example here was a tinnitus uh, buzzing in the ear, which occurred after a spinal stimulator were put on. And so with that case, this is an ear, nose and throat symptom originating from a neurological device. And then the second one, this was a pacemaker that caused an issue with the nerves in the arm leading to a misdiagnosis of uh, epilepsy when actually it was a muscle spasm from the pacemaker. So the intersection of how a device can end in downstream effects that aren't relevant to the origina originating specialty is really tricky. So the technology experts, so more, more people in this room might be interested in this bit. So in terms of where the stuff can fail, bringing back this uh, image again, We've looked at sort of the hardware from the neurostimulator all the way up to the electrodes, and then the software itself on the tablet, which can set the device settings. And then obviously you have the connectivity, whether that's the radio frequency telemetry or the Bluetooth, which can also be interfered with and cause errors. So each stage of this process can result in patient harm if something goes wrong. In terms of the things that can go wrong, so it's easy to sort of differentiate these things, I think, along the lines of malicious and non-malicious. Things break, we know that things break, Soft, uh, hardware breaks, software can go wrong, and also you can just have interference. So the electromagnetic interference uh, paragraph here, or electric smog, which I quite like as a term, um, refers to the different forms of electromagnetic radiation from the environment that can interact with a medical device. And this is from a systematic review I've been doing at the moment, looking at case reports. And it shows that things like pacemakers, deep brain stimulators, spinal stimulators can be interfered with from anything from smooth core generators to electrostatic discharges from clothing, Fitbits, Apple watches, coexisting devices. So if you're a patient with a pacemaker, but then suddenly you need an implanted insulin pump, are these two things gonna overlap? How are you gonna manage that interference? And then you have your more malicious stuff, so targeted hacks. And this has been demonstrated kind of as proof of concepts. The two articles at the top there, one talks about hacking NHS pacemakers and the variety of vulnerabilities there are there. And then the other one was a demonstration of 
how to hack an insulin pump. And this person did it from about 200 meters away and demonstrated that they had to deliver a lethal dose of insulin if they wanted to to that patient. Uh, I am the cavalry of a really cool um, group, mainly in America, who investigate these things, look at cyber attacks, track vulnerabilities and different devices. So if you want to see more about that, they're quite a good resource to go and have a look at. On the point of brain technologies, uh, Laurie Piper wrote an article about brain jacking, which is the term they've coined for the unauthorized takeover of someone's brain implant. So looking specifically at these kind of deep brain stimulated technology. And they demonstrate that you don't have to be particularly sophisticated to cause harm with these patients. You can just manipulate the hardware and cause harm to tissues, or you can try and eavesdrop and extreme, uh, extract some of the streaming data. You can drain the battery. And as we heard with the patient who everyone mistook for sepsis, that can present with really um, concerning features. And then beyond deep brain stimulators, this is consistent across many medical devices. And when you start looking into the field of medical devices, you realize there are so many implantables which can go wrong. So an example of a hardware fault was a cochlear implant in a pregnant lady who had had this for years, but suddenly started reporting electric shocks in the brain, saying something's really wrong, struggling to walk, and she was ignored for months and months and months because people checked externally while well, the device settings look okay. And it wasn't until later surgery that they found that the uh, sheath of the electrode was actually broken. And then the scar tissue was pressing on the facial nerve. And so in this case, even though the external checks of the device settings seemed normal, it was the interaction with the body where the scar tissue that formed also caused an anatomical uh, harm. And then software, we talked about DDS failures. Connectivity is becoming increasingly relevant uh, within closed loop systems. So any piece of technology that automatically adjusts according to sensor settings, if that becomes disturbed and you deliver, say, the wrong medication, it can have really concerning effects. And so this case study here was about a death that occurred uh, in a woman who had an insulin pump due to too much insulin in the glucose dropping so late. So we can think about the vulnerabilities in terms of that hardware, software, and connectivity breakdown. We can also think about it in terms of the patient journey. So when they're accessing care, has there been an attack on the hospital, a cyber attack that's meant medical records are no longer available? Presentation, the symptoms and signs, especially with device failures. Investigations, if our laboratories go down, how are we supposed to look at these patients? And then management, if our drug delivery systems aren't working correctly. This is just an example of what occurs when each of those stages go wrong. So the top example there, which I think is maybe most relevant, um, was a case report that described a series of ventilators that had an automated loop where they would adjust the airway settings for a patient based on sort of the feedback they were getting. But there was a problem with the automated loop, which meant they were changing the delivered airway pressures and it was leading to cardiac arrests in these patients. But the physicians would attend to these patients and not understand what was going on because they didn't necessarily understand the technology itself. And so it's how, um, when we don't have this communication between the healthcare and then the digital developers, you get this really strange pathology that's difficult to manage or interpret. This was a paper from uh, Christian Dameth and his team in the USA, who looked at all of the areas of healthcare infrastructure, which can be compromised either unintentionally or due to cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And we can see that the implanted devices are just one very small component of this. You have to think about all the wider support systems, the facilities, also any of the imaging devices, laboratory, all of this is vulnerable and impacts on patient care. With that, this means that we have a lot of stakeholders in the space who aren't necessarily all talking to each other. I think patients are obviously the main key stakeholder here, and then the clinicians who receive them, but also the companies who are developing these devices, developing the technology. The regulatory bodies like the FDA in the UK is the MHRA. So we reported this case to both of those uh, bodies but it's a voluntary process. It's not something you're necessarily trained in a medical school. So it's quite possible that when these things do happen, they don't come upstream to the actual regulatory bodies. The intelligence community who are mapping sort of emerging threats to health, there's an interest in terms of how vulnerable does this make the population? What do you need to be concerned about if the nation state actor wants to take out healthcare infrastructure? Coroners who investigate suspicious deaths, I'm working with them now in North London and they're very aware that there is no protocol for if you have a suspicious death and you're concerned about a device and no one does digital forensics after a device and sometimes patients just get buried with them. So we're missing a little step there in the process. Medical technicians and then hackers and security researchers. So with regards to the hackers and the security researchers, 
which might be what people here are more interested in. There's an evolving kind of domain of ethical hacking in healthcare and how we can improve a lot of the vulnerabilities that exist. So this was from May Contain Hackers in the Netherlands this year. If anyone's um, not been, I'd recommend. It's really, really fun. Um, we ran a few workshops there on medical device hacking where we took different devices to see what people could do with them. And so the top picture there is a glucose sensor in a potato. It turns out potatoes have a similar glucose to humans, at least for the first few hours. So it's quite a useful guinea pig for us to um, try and hack and get around patient confidentiality issues. Um, <laughs> and they were very easily eavesdropped on, so, so they were quite simple. And then TENS machine is the second one. So this is sort of a sticky uh, patch that delivers an electrical current to muscles and it can help reduce pain. And um, with that one, it was streaming to a phone and they were able to manipulate it. And the concern with that is it's also interventional. So if you manipulate the voltage setting with that, you can directly induce muscle damage. And then the last one we looked at was heart rate monitors. And can you uh, affect kind of the information that's streamed to the device? These are group, uh, a group, well, a number of different groups just to mention, um, especially people online want to um, take an image of it if they're interested in the space. They all look at different elements of medical cybersecurity, medical hacking, um, and also sort of social activism within this space, patient data rights, what can be done to protect patient care. So that's everything. And firstly, just bring it back to Isaac, the patient who allowed all of this to happen, who is now fit and well again, but has obviously concerns about the device, devices that um, exist. And there's a few things we're doing in the space. We're doing, doing a workshop at UCL in February next year, if you'd like to come along. The people who inject um, the RFID chips into hands will be there. Um, they, can, they can do some demos, so we're looking for volunteers. Um, and then we're doing some training for clinicians on these kind of crises and developing an interest group. So if you are uh, keen to learn more, get in touch. Always happy to, to collaborate. All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Isabel, for this uh, insightful and very terrifying talk. <laughs> I'll yeah. stop quickly the recording and we can go over to the good day.